Thanks, uh, Marwan and Creative Mornings, for inviting me to talk. This is kind of new to me, too. I'm just freshly kind of emerging, just like everyone else, out of COVID. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm a little nervous, but um, we'll get through it. I think we'll get through it. You got this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so the topic today is truth. And then I thought about it. What is truth? So me, I think truth can be very simple. It could be very tender, and it could be very beautiful. And also, I think sometimes truth can be very sad and painful, and dark, and sometimes terrifying and hard to talk about. And I think sometimes truth is kind of like an onion. You know, you kind of have to slowly peel away at it until it kind of slowly reveals itself. So, instead of talking about truth, I think I'll talk more about, you know, my art process and my art, uh, my artwork and my life. So in my search of truth, I ask questions, I often start with questioning. You know, I ask questions like, you know, what's the meaning of life? Why do we struggle? Why choose fear? And then I also ask other questions. I ask questions like, you know, why the head tax? Why the Chinese head tax? Here, there's an image of me eye to eye with Johnny McDonald. It's at Ottawa's airport. I asked, at this moment, I was st staring eye to eye with him, and I was having conversations with him, and I was asking questions. You know, why did you create the Chinese Immigration Act? Why did you displace Chinese Canadian families? Why the Chinese Exclusion Act? So I'm a, my artwork is obviously very personal. It's very autobiographical. I draw from my own personal experiences. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. That means I use a variety of mediums. The idea of my project, what I want to express in my artwork, usually determines what materials I use. So in this case, you know, I used an old vintage menu from my family's restaurant, which opened in 1971 on Somerset Street. And you can see there's a $50 bill, and I wrote on the $50 bill. To me, it's a blank canvas. It's just a piece of paper. And I wanted to use that because it expressed, I was looking at the, the bill, and it has William Lyon Mackenzie King on it. And he was the prime minister at the time, and he's the one that legislated the Chinese Exclusion Act, which completely separated families for over 25 years. So I use my tangible links to history. This year is a really special year for me and my family. We're uh, celebrating 100 years as settlers, as guests on these lands. So here you see on the left-hand side, I inserted myself into the landscape. I'm holding my grandfather's certificate, head tax certificate, which he spent $500 in 1922. He was only 11 years old when he arrived. It'll actually be a few days from now that he actually arrived and landed and settled roots here in Hull, and then eventually Ottawa. 
So he died the year I was born, and I, I didn't get to know him, only through like shared storytelling and photo albums. So in this piece, in this diptych, you can see I'm holding a measuring tape. I measured the height of him as a little boy, immigrating at the age of 11, paying the head tax. And it was a way for me to envision him and visualize him. And it was a way for me to get to know him again. So through my process of investigation, I often come across very unsettling images, images that you know, weren't taught to me in school, weren't taught to me in history class. So like images like this, it's called The Gatekeepers. It's from B the BC Saturday Sunset from 1907. It's an illustration by artist M.H. Hawkins. So it illustrates white immigration and oriental exclusion. So in this image on the left-hand side, you'll see you know, European settlers kind of strolling through the gate, very easy, no difficulty. Immig immigrants from all ranges of age, from young to old, there's men and women. And then on the right-hand side, there's a woman wrapped in a British flag with her arm one arm in a gesture of welcoming, and then the other one is she's pushing the gate. And behind that gate that she's holding are Chinese immigrants. And in this image, they're depicted as very sad looking, very depressing, very gaunt-like. They kind of are like compressed behind the gate like animals. So how do I process these kind of histories, these kind of narratives? How do I reconcile with what I come across with and learn? So to help me understand these images, I created this little maquette model of the exact gate from that image. It took me about three to four days to create this, and that process of creating it really helped me, underst helped me understand you know, these histories and these narratives. So, you know, growing up, I was always in search of my stories, our stories, our histories. So I would go to libraries, I would go to galleries, I would go to museums, and I never saw myself reflected in those spaces. Like the National Gallery, for instance. I walked through the Canadiana section, and I never saw people like me. It always left me asking, where are the QT, BIPOC people? the colored people, where are the Chinese people? So that I created this series. It's called Invisible Identities. It's, uh, it was a way for me to disrupt that kind of narrative of erasure that I saw happening. And uh, it was also a way for me to dismantle those narratives of racism. So this series was to honor those men that labored in Chinese restaurants, early Chinese Canadian settlers that were forced into restaurant labor. All these clothings are made of paper ephemera. They're all menus that I collected from different Chinese restaurants within 150 kilometers of Gatineau and Ottawa. 
So I sewed them together in the shape of a dress shirt. And then this is a waiter's vest. This series wasn't about being sad because our lives weren't sad. You know, there was laughter. There was dinners around the table. There was storytelling with elders. And then we all know this image, you people. You know, racism is sometimes very subtle. It's very quiet. Sometimes it's very quiet. But then also sometimes it's very visceral and in your face hate. You know, you people has kind of like haunted me my whole life. So when Don Cherry went on national television and spoke about you people, and that message went across Canada from coast to coast to coast, and then when I heard it, I knew exactly what he was saying, and I knew exactly who he was talking about. So sometimes my work is very reactionary, and I don't, I don't spend a lot of time. I don't peel the layers, I just react. And this was one of them. The next day, I put the Chinese takeout menus through my inkjet printer, and I put like a whole series of text on it. Not just you people. The other texts were luck and resilience and family and strength. Oh, God. So then rewind back to COVID, March 13th. We all were in lockdown. I remember exactly where I was. It was Friday night. We were, Doug Ford asked us all to lock down our, close down our businesses and go home and stay home. So that night I went home and I was in my studio. And I was already dealing with the loss of my, both my parents. So I felt so low. I felt so defeated. You know, I went online, and then all my friends were struggling with loss of work. All my creative friends were struggling with loss of inspiration. So then I stayed in my studio, and I sat there in the silence of the darkness. And I was reminded of why I rise. I was reminded of those queer men in the, in the queer community that fought the stigma of the AIDS crisis. And I was reminded of my grandfather and my parents and my ancestors and all the struggles that they went through. And then all of a sudden, my, my problems didn't seem so bad. So I went into the studio and I made my first pandemic mask. The lockdowns are really long. I put all my energy into making masks. I was really productive. <laughs> COVID also allowed me to reflect and look from above at what was happening in the world. I saw patterns of oppression. I saw Black Lives Matter happen. And it reminded me of Africville. And then indigenous communities were struggling with residential schools. Buddhist temples were being vandalized and even Dr. Zeus was being banned. So I made this piece with my friend, Barry Ace. 
and the sculpture reminds me of a kid's toy building blocks. But it's not what just children learn, it's what we as adults, we learn. <laughs> so I'm just gonna cycle through my work and my body work to kind of give you a better picture of, if you already haven't got a better picture of my body of work. So this was called A Foreign Space. It was at Carleton University. This piece is called Luck. It was at Gallery uh, 112 in Nepean. This quilt was made up of hundreds of Chinese takeout menus and like over 400 lucky red envelopes. So also during COVID, I watched Chinatowns all across Canada being, and seniors being targeted. You know, seniors that look like my parents being pushed to the ground. And I was stuck at home. I wanted to show allyship and connection with those suffering in other Chinatowns. So I created a series of images that I transferred onto plates. They're crushed fortune cookies, and I reimagined the text. And the text were all inspired by rally signs that I had seen in Chinatowns across Canada. I made a huge ceramic fortune cookie the size of a basketball. And I went into the garage, I took a two by four, and I smashed the fortune cookie into like 100 pieces. So this year was a really good year for me. I did two performances. I'm not a performance artist, so it was amazing for me to kind of like immerse myself into it, and dive right into it. <laughs> this was at Axe Neo Set for Perf. I had created a tea ceremony where I ripped my grandfather's head tax into small little bits and I made a pot of tea. And I served that tea to my guests at my table. I also had the opportunity of crossing Canada. I was invited to Vancouver by Paul Wong to be the featured artist for Pride in Chinatown. And I love that pun on words, Pride in Chinatown, Pride. It reminds me of pride in self, pride in community, but also as a queer man, it reminds me of pride as a, as a queer. So I visited five different Chinatowns, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, Toronto, Markham, and everywhere I went, I would look for a Chinatown. I would also look for my gay, my gays, right? So I would go to Davies Street. I would go to Church Street. And then I would document my journey across Canada and I would 
bring these frames from an old Chinese lantern. So I imbued these frames with a lot of emotion, a lot of love, a lot of memory and history. And I documented my trip across Canada with these frames. And it was a way of me seeing myself reflected in the Canadian landscape. So I think art is a really powerful tool for healing. I think art is a really powerful tool for transformation and social justice. So before I end my talk today, I just want to leave you guys with two prompts. One is, you know, what fuels you? What fuels your day? What fuels you to wake up and take on the day? Why do you do what you do? And then what makes you rise? And then the second prompt is, you know, when you're walking through Chinatown, it doesn't matter where it is, could be anywhere across Canada, you know, just take the time to stop and think and reflect that these communities are amazing that they even exist against all odds. That Chinatowns are physical manifestations of what resilience and strength look like. And I think they should be celebrated and cherished That's it, thanks. But Don, um, you, you talked about traveling. When you travel, you stop by different Chinatowns uh, and you seek out Nikkei villages. Um, what similarities have you found between the two communities? Oh, that's a good question. I love Kimberly Crenshaw's, her, she coined the term intersectionality. I love that. We didn't have, I didn't have these terms or hashtags, anti-Asian hate hashtags, or hashtag resilience when I was growing up. We just did it. We just tried to work our way through these struggles. But as a queer man and as a Chinese, you know, I've seen if I made a graph and, I, and one graph was racism and one was homophobia, in my lifetime, I would say racism has always been a steady current, upward current, and homophobia has really kind of died. I don't worry about it anymore. It's not what worries me about leaving the house. Until the last situation in Colorado, right? So when I travel across Canada, I see so many, so many similarities between Chinatowns and queer villages. You know, we just, queers just want a, a space where we could feel protected and safe. We want to create a community that where we can generate commerce so we can survive. And Chinatowns are built the same way. So I love that similarity. I've had the privilege of knowing Don for years. And it's very brave of him to come up and speak his truth. So thank you, Don. And he's always taken inspiration from his life for his work. So my question is, you touched on the COVID restrictions and putting everything in silence and darkness as a, maybe what spurred you to this? Is that what spurred you to ask questions about the Chinese history and exclusion of uh, past family members? I think, I think it was something inherent in me as a child. 
I knew there was always something other, something that wasn't answered that I always was trying to explore. Thanks so much, Jill. That's a good question. We have time for a few more. Oh, well, I was thinking, uh, you know, in Chinatown, I learned everything I needed to know about my heritage, myself, my culture, my language. And then I would go outside of Chinatown and I would learn French and English and about colonial settler histories. So that's one thing I cherish about these communities. It's, they, they offer me a way to see myself reflected. Getting here. Um, yeah, your talk touched me on so many levels. Um, also, as a third generation Chinese um, Canadian, um, lots, lots of history there that I find I didn't realize until I was older as well about what, what my family has, has gone through. Um, my question though, I, well, I recently read this article about the future of Chinatowns and how they are on decline um, for various reasons. But, you know, I look at our own Chinatown and what's happening, and I know you're so, so close to that community. I just wondered if you could touch on, you know, how is it going and how could the community rally behind that to, to help make it thrive? Oh, that's such a, oh, that's such a good question. I, that's, you know, that's, Oh my God, Jane, that's, a, that's a, a question that every community that I went to, every Chinatown I went to, I have a, I have a show in the Dr. Sun Yat Sen Gardens right now, currently, and all the staff, all the shops, they were all there at the opening. You know, they, they were all there. They wanted to see themselves represented too. They wanted these, to hear someone talk about these conversations. How can we support our own communities Maybe they didn't have words for it. Maybe they didn't want to say erasure of the communities, or but the spirit was there, and they want, and they were in search of the answers. And I found that was a very common thread across from like people I would meet in Calgary, and I would listen to their histories and their stories, and then Montreal and Markham. So. I think there's a foundation being created where we can talk about these now. I'm not the only one talking about it. Before, I used to go to the library and I would look through the Rolodex and I would find Chinese. I would go for Chinese, Asian, anything. And it was always those art history books that were very romanticized, sculptural, stoic, kind of dead sculptures. But I think now, like we, we live in such an age of communication where, where there's a different generation like us that are talking about it. And I've been taught as a queer man, you know, like our voice is, has strength, our voice has power. And to heal that trauma and to heal that pain is to identify it and to identify that truth, identify that pain and confront it and move forward. And I, I find that that was happening a lot in the faces of the people that I was talking with. You know, just support your Chinatowns. Go there, eat, <laughs> shop. I bought amazing, an amazing singing bowl in the shop beside our family's restaurant yesterday. And then I got to know Stephen, the owner. I mean, build relationships. I, th I think some of you guys know that I've been trying to do that in Chinatowns for years. So it's nice to see others kind of taking on that role. Like people like Henry Liu, Henry Yu, the professor at UBC. You know, people creating documentaries. Yeah, it's really wonderful. <laughs>